This artist talk is part of our exhibition that we have up in our space right now called We Live Memories of Resistance. And I will drop a link into the chat in a moment here so you can um, take a look at the 3D tour we have of this space, including Felipe's really beautiful piece that's included as part of the show. So I'm gonna give a quick intro to these two incredible artists who will be in conversation this evening and then hand it off to Felipe. So tonight we're joined by artist and Oxy professor Cantura Davis and in plain sight artist Felipe Baeza. Cantura and Felipe became friends while MFA students at the Yale School of Art program. And now four years later, they're here tonight to discuss their respective practices, parallels between their work today and when they first met and the larger context of their work in our cultural and political climate. Cantara Davis is an artist working between Los Angeles and Accra, Ghana. Her work oscillates between various facets of portraiture and design. Using text as a point of departure, she explores the fundamental role that language has in shaping how we understand ourselves and the world around us. This manifests in a very variety of forms, including drawings, textiles, sculpture, and performances. And born in Guanajuato, Mexico, Felipe Baeza incorporates painting and printmaking to examine how memory, migration, and displacement work to create a state of hybridity and fugitivity. Baeza's art practice aims to imagine structures and possibilities for the self-emancipation of the fugitive body that lives in and is persistently subjected to hostile conditions. Baeza's work um, that's currently part of the show tonight will be what we open up this conversation with. And so with that, I'm gonna um, pass it off to Felipe to share about his work and then we'll move into a conversation with Kentra. Hi, how's it going? I uh, just want to clarify that people could see me um, and see me at the same time. Um, I oh, I want to start by saying thank you for for the invitation and to the many that made this possible. I'm also happy to be sharing my work and being in conversation with peers that I admire. Um, but also in between this collaboration between In Plain Sight and Occidental College through the show. Uh, we Live Memories of Resistance, curated by Kyle Stephen and Paulina Lara. And obviously, thank you to Casillos and Rafa Sparza for their work in, in plain sight and for bringing together around 80 individuals who are invested and in, affected by immigration detention, but also by the culture of incarceration in, in the US. And a special thank you to Kentaro Davis for joining me tonight. And it's always lovely to see you and, and be in conversation. Uh, before we start the slides, I, I would want to talk about the work in the show, but it's also important to share a little bit of, of my background and context. Uh, I, my artistic trajectory is tied to, to my history of migration. I was born in Mexico and raised in Chicago, and I was first exposed to, to art in my preteen years through Chicago's community programs. But also I grew up in Pilsen. Uh, which at that time in the 90s and still to this day is predominantly a Mexican neighborhood. Uh, I grew up surrounded by political art and, 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 the mu and murals and was exposed to the importance of, of art as a political tool. And also my first introduction to, to a museum was also in Pilsen uh, through a museum um, that since then has changed its name, but it was the Mexican Fine Arts Center Museum and was exposed to, to the role of printmaking in, in Mexico's history as a easily disseminated art form that uh, that exposed social and political concerns. And lean, lean up to high school graduation and college didn't really seem like, a, like an option or reality because of my immigration status. Luckily, I met with representatives from the Cooper Union and they gave me an early admission application and I didn't really take it seriously because I knew I was going to, I wasn't going to be able to afford it not knowing that at that time it was a fully funded program. So that's how I ended up in New York in 2005. And it was at Cooper Union that I first had my intense, uh, intensive introduction to printmaking and that was through silkscreen with a course with Lorenzo Clayton. And, and after this, I wanted to emerge myself. And so I took courses in, in, on printmaking and its history. And also at the same time, I was also taking formal classes in painting and drawing, but none of them uh, resonated with me as much as the way making like printmaking did. And this is in part because I enjoy 
the process of constructing and working through layers, which we're going to see in, in the next slides possible. Um, and maybe this is a good time to start the slide. So be, before, uh, before Cooper, which was where I did my undergrad, and, and during my time at Cooper, I was archiving similar images like the ones you're seeing right now. And I was very much interested in how, how the body in these images are contained during its transportation to, to, uh, to a new place. But once they arrive there, they're still contained metaphorically. Most, most of these individuals are undocumented in the U.S. and will be undocumented for several years after they arrive. Uh, the U.S. government, as we know, historically has been very direct about who it allows to participate in its social, political, and economic spaces. And undocumented people are often not allowed in this part participation. Um, so, you know, throughout my time there, and as I mentioned before, there I was archiving similar images and sort of being um, attracted in the way one puts their body to. Um, and actually, the image on the right um, was an image that I used for for the actual piece that it's right now being shown. Um, can we go to the next slide? And this is the piece actually that's been shown right now. Um, and what we can see here is that I, that I struggled to figure out how, how to work with these images. You know, around this time, I started to incorporate embroidery as a mark making tool, as well as a, as a technique to, to abstract such a problematic image for me. So the viewer wasn't fully able to absorb the image. And what happens here is that the use of embroidery in the work and in my practice is, is a mode of, of drawing and also outlining forms in which it allows me to obscure and defer the gaze almost mimicking pain marks or, and, and, and drips. Um, and even though as, as someone who, who experienced such a journey, I, I find it difficult to see these images. Um, how do we, and I've always asked myself that, you know, how do we work with, with such archival materials to make new narratives rather than replicating the same systems that, um, of violence that produced them, you know? And, and I, I'm rather more interested in, in working with these materials to produce uh, a different kind of rendering and investigation, you know? But at the same time, this, this work is, is a significant part of my studio practice and journey. You know, and I needed to make this work to arrive where I am now. And, and also how it, is, how it helped me enter my current body of work that is so much about that middle space uh, that a migrant goes through in order to reach to the other side. And I guess what I'm speaking about is that interstitial space. And that, that space is often a very violent experience. You know, people sacrifice everything and could potentially lose their lives and often put their bodies through terrible conditions to see what's on the other side. And what I can say and find uh, remarkable about the migrant imaginary is that one puts everything on the line to imagine another kind of life as possible. Um, so I'm extremely happy to, to be sharing this piece. I actually haven't shown this piece probably since it was made back in, you know, or this is time, this is like 2009, 2010. Um, and we go to the next slide. And what here we see is a detail of a piece titled Cajuela de Sueños, translated to uh, car trunk of dreams or trunk of dreams. Um, and here is a detail where you are able to see the, the embroidered text uh, of a road sign that is visible through the US-Mexico border. And this road sign reads, um, warning, if you're entering the United States without presenting yourself to an immigration officer, you may be arrested and prosecuted for violating US immigration laws. And what I was interested in what, and what this, uh, detail allows you to see is how these two images are are sort of embedded together as a metaphor and how immigration laws follow and are bound to individuals and dictate their new landscape which is uh, pretty much a landscape of fear and being captured and as i mentioned this is a very important piece to me and to my development as an artist but also uh, is where i begin to conceptualize the ideas of the fugitive body which is a theme that I'm 
centering in my current, and maybe this is something we can talk about in the conversation. And next slide. Next slide. And this might be like a huge jump. Um, so the piece you saw before, you know, it was working around 2009, 2010, and now this is a jump to, to 2016, where I'm still working with this, with these, with these kind of images. And and this is also where I start graduate school, fall of 2016, and and I take these images uh, and these archives with me, and I continue my interest in responding to these images. You know, I begin to to embroider the image. Uh, on a physical map that I had found uh, and trying to deal, because I was struggling with this image and specifically how the, the figures were, um, were very visible and I was more interested in embedding and abstracting the image. So obviously what you see on the left is an image that the media in many ways produces to kind of give us an idea and an image of what migration looks like, right? Um, and on the left, this is actually the back of the piece when I had started to embroider the image and just seeing how I was invisible it was. Um, and we can go to the next slide. And this is the front of, of the actual when I started working on the piece. So you kind of see here um, me using in many ways, this is where the, the twine comes in in a different form and not, not embroidery, but I'm using twine here to, in many ways, uh, uh, add layer to the map, and I'm outlining each each state with the twine. And as I mentioned, this is probably a month in into graduate school, uh, and very much I was coming from a very traditional printmaking background where I was making editions and mostly working through etching and, and and relief. And I wanted to have a sort of separation from that and continue the print form. But in this case, I was still interested in printing, so. In this case, I was I was building the map as a matrix, and by that I mean that I was lay, I was building up the map to function as a holograph. So I was basically um, using textures to build up tone. Eventually, when I was going to be able to print it. And next slide. And here is images of my studio at that time. You know, as I said, I was like maybe like a month in. Um, into school and and using the map as sort of the first piece I was most most interested in in, in pursuing, um, and in many ways these were all very new experiences. And by that I mean that the, the way that I was working I had never worked in before, and in trying to in many ways separate myself from the press and not relying on the press to make work. Where here the floor becomes the press. So what you see on the left side is the actual map on on the floor, and there's a sheet of plastic, and the plastic in many ways functions as, as the press. So we also see on the right, far right is the, the process itself of, of me printing and basically just making mono prints and, and, and there's you know a, layers of water and pigments and basically what I would lay is the paper over and eventually once everything's fully dry, it would absorb um, as much as it could. Um, and, and this process is repeated several times and, and it di dictates the color palette. This is also a process where, um, where the outcome is very much out of my control. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And after undergoing a series of printing methods, this is the final work, um, which is currently on view on, uh, at LACMA as part of their exhibition titled A View From Here. Uh, and many are quick to point out that I was responding to Trump's election presidential win <laughs> four years ago. You know, the sort of time, kind of energy that we we're still in was also what we were feeling four years ago. But but many are point to question that I was responding to Trump's election. And I'm I will I always like to say that while this work reflects the time of fall 2016, which is when I completed it. This work is also much of a response to the themes of migration and inhumane enforcement practices that are front and center in my work. You know, when I say when I say this, I'm not trying to dismiss how the current administration increased resources into immigration enforcement and implemented a stricter uh, immigration policy, but we have to confront that the current US immigration system has an expansive history beyond this administration. You know, according to DHS, 
records from 2000 to 2016, over 5 million people have been deported, uh, with the majority of those occurring through the Obama administration. Uh, and the conditions of immigration detention also continue to bring attention to a range of human right violations. You know, these are just two examples uh, of, of the many ways uh, in which immigration enforcement affects our lives as, as immigrants. And go to the next slide. Uh, hey, Felipe. Hi. Kentura Kentur here, everybody. I I just wanna, we'll probably come back to this image when we talk, but I just wanna linger on it um, for a moment before you proceed. Um, I'm really interested in, in this idea of working with the printmaking medium, but even thinking of a map. And I believe, I mean, you found this map, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, um, I found this map and had archived that it actually had found it probably when I was an undergrad and had just been traveling with me. Um, and when I say I found it, I literally found it on a garbage <laughs> and had been, you know, I was wanting to respond. Also me contesting to to what this map represents to me, you know, um, and, and in many ways, as I mentioned, I came into grad school thinking, all right, well, let me rely on the same tools that I knew, which was printmaking which for me, this map, I wanted to showcase it again because it was also a breakthrough, just like the piece prior to this, that my intention was to, to print it, you know, to, for it to be this, for, for the actual piece that I'm showing, not to be the actual piece, but for, for the print of it to be the, be the piece. Uh, but once it came to the state where I was like, hey, well, I actually, through this printing process that I, you know, kind of reinvented in the studio, I was allowed to do what I wanted to do. You know, in this case, you really can't see the embroidered image of those individuals crossing the border, you know? And, and very much you're still could kind of make up that it's actually a map. Um, but I actually like that through the process of, of back and forth of, between these printed process that those things are embedded very much into, into the actual map. Beyond that, they're embroidered in there, you know? So they're very much right. in there into the fabric. I mean, map. something I, I was really interested in seeing um, and being reminded of is the process shot, the one where you, we can clearly see the um, embroidery from the mm -hmm. backside. And so even making um, that sort of like outline, it kind of fixes the figure by having to sort of, um, uh, uh, I guess, define, define the figure into the map. But all mm -hmm. these processes that you went um, the sort of like journey of the map, like in a way figuratively, but also literally, like knowing that you found this map, you carried it with you at a certain point, and then started to um, overlay your own uh, work to bring a new kind of embodiment and a different way to seeing and understanding and thinking about maps and boundaries. Um, but also the fact that like the figure is so defined, you can see it from the backside, but you know, all the things you did to the paper really sort of um, uh, collapses the figure and the ground in a way that I think speaks to what you're addressing in the work um, quite profoundly. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what I wanted. I mean, this idea that we might go back into later, idea about visibility and invisibility and who gets accorded that, right? I think we see ideas of visibility as, as something positive. Whereas for a lot of us, visibility is a trap, you know? That means, you know, being captured or, or, or being dead. Um, and not to romanticize that, you know? Not to be like, uh, it's such a, you know, like I, I would wanna live in <laughs> invisibility through the rest of my life, but it's also a way that many of us survive and thrive in this country through invisibility. Um, and I mean, I think one thing that happened while making the map was, you know, I was outlining each state and obviously each state at that time and to this date has its own, um, own, own set of laws in regards to immigration or how they treat immigrants, you know? Um, whereas we know that there was a sort of spread of anti-immigrant laws in the South, you know, this idea of, of, of making it so unbearable for immigrants to live there that they will either have to leave the state or basically self-deport, you know, which happened in Georgia and Arizona and in other Southern states. Um, 
but I think that's also to say that, I mean, I, I grew up in Chicago, right? And then came to New York and to an extent there are, those two cities are very friendly to immigrants, right? So, and I don't have to go far to the South to experience fear, you know, but I, I could just go to Buffalo, New York and it'll be a whole different situation. Um, but I would have to maybe sidetrack that after undergrad uh, and before grad school, I was somewhat involved around immigrant rights uh, um, organizing and I had gone to the South and just seen the reality, you know, that was very much a very different reality. But, and, and, and asking myself like, why would these individuals live here? But I think it took me to respond like, you just, you just managed to, to live, you know, it's like you just kind of take in your surroundings and in many ways manage to live you know, with those limitations and make the best of them. And like, that's all you know in many ways. Thank you. No problem. So we go, I mean, we go to the next slide and just see like the details of, of the actual map. And in here, obviously, there's something that happens here that when you spend more time with the map, it starts to in way, many ways reveal itself. And it goes back to this back and forth uh, where, where the actual um, figure, you know, disappears and comes back, you know, and, and it's like trying to make up the actual other figures that are in there. Um, but also how the map in many ways became the sort of metallic residual of, of the many layers of, of the plastic, um, but also embedding um, embedding both, both the twine and the embroidery that happens, sort of mesh up that also happened with, with the other piece that I was showing. And we can go to the next slide. And this is, I think it was important for me also to show the, the back of the piece, you know, that, um, that it reveals something else. Um, and obviously here, when you were seeing shots of the studio, I'm, I'm very much working on the floor and, and that's primarily how I work on the floor because of the materials that I'm using. Obviously because of gravity, I'm working with a lot of water. Um, so in here, you actually can see like my footsteps on the map. Um, just seeing like that I'm at physically very much, my whole body is in, very much invested with the piece and me grubbing or, or sanding or peeling or cutting. Um, and then we go to the next slide. And I wanted to include this, this work too. It's also work that I was making maybe after the map um, in a smaller scale. Um, and also thinking about me going back to printing and in ways that I wanted to do with the maps. And here I'm, I'm also using um, various uh, elements from the past projects that I had shown where um, there's a figure that I have completely erased, you know, but it's been erased either through collage or decollage. So I'm either adding or taking. So the figure is drawn with, um, with twine or it's carved in with a Dremel. Uh, and basically what, what you're seeing is just layers of magazine papers glued together. Um, and what I was thinking about this, this project is just, it's like how maybe the printing process could reveal something else. So this, this plate itself, I mean, because they function as a, as a plate. So you're able to ink it up and print it. Uh, and maybe we can go to the next slide and just show a detail. So what you can see here is obviously the face vaguely is, is embroidered. And on your left and your right, there's twine. But also what you're seeing is just various layers of magazine paper. And you could kind of vaguely see also how I was able, since it's, it's so thick, you know, it leads from, it, it's, um, I'm able to carve in, you know, different elements into it, or also embed elements into it. And we go to the next slide. And here, it, what it allows is, is, is this printing process, you know, that I was thinking about with the map. And obviously, it treated as a holograph, you know, so I'm able to ink the piece uh, itself as a plate, and then obviously use these collage elements as, as chine collé, um, and what you're seeing on your right is basically the, the after printing, you know. And what, what this was interesting about this project is just obviously how it reveals the image. And, 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 and my interest in that and, 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 and how the actual piece, you really, can, you really can't really make out an image, but it's made visible through the printing process. And we can go to the next slide. And here's sort of the production that came from, 
from the actual just one plate, you know, that I was able to make a series of these with different elements here, either using either collage from cutouts or just making basically silhouettes of hands and, and embed materials where here is glitter. And just seeing, obviously, depending on how the plate was wiped, I would get different things from the actual surface, you know, so that you, what happens here is that you're able to create tones through just different textures, through the carving, through the embedding of, of, of twine, and also through the embroidery that happens. And go to the next slide. And this is a, uh, maybe this is like a, a good transition to bring Kintura into, into the conversation um, where we can discuss or work and practice as we move through the following slides. Hi, Kintura. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? Um, I'm good. I'm great. This is exciting um, to talk to you um, like this uh, among other people. Um, do you, do you want to talk about this piece first and then? Yeah. Okay. No, I think, yeah, I mean, I think I put these two pieces together because it would be a dream to have those two pieces in many ways in a physical form. Um, but thinking about how obviously we're both working with figuration, no, but um, in many ways, we're also working with that sort of uh, how do we uh, deal with the gaze, no, and how in very much way you're, you're rendering these these figures and individuals, which you know, you know, through a, to, through a repetition, where is it with handwriting or with a stamp? And in my case, also with collage, you know, how, how, do, how does one render a body with these fragmented processes? Um, and that's what I was interested in that happens very much, this sort of comparison that I've seen through our work and how we work, you know, that we're, we started in many ways with this, our interest in, in, a, in a printmaking method and have pushed it to, to be something else and to produce other other ways of existing. Yeah, I mean, um, I in terms of printmaking, I also did a lot of printmaking in undergrad, which I don't know if we said it, I went to Occidental for undergrad and uh, studied art and anthropology there, which I'd love to talk about anthropology, archaeology too, because <laughs> um, I think we both have interests in that as well. But um, uh, I really started to under, really think about ma materials um, through printmaking process and the possibilities with paper, the history of paper and, and how it's been used over time to disseminate information. And so I've for a long time been interested in um, uh, working through that medium and I'd say, so I guess we should say, you know, Felipe, as was mentioned in the introduction, we met four years ago um, at Yale uh, at the start. And um, my memory is that we became fast friends. <laughs> um, but I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting space to be in as a sort of graduate level um, art program. And I was already for a long time interested in portraiture and um, making figurative work. And I'd say my work changed and expanded uh, drastically during those two years. Um, I spent most of the two years not making portraits, but then uh, was deeply um, influenced by experimentation and other forms uh, when I did return to figuration after grad school. And one of the things that I was interested in, and just like as a, as, a, as a thing, as an entity, as a sort of condition where, you know, in a program like that, you're showing your work where you've made material choices and the sort of, um, need to draw a conclusion about the visual experience you're having looking at various artworks. And a tendency with um, portraiture to draw very quick conclusions. And I realized that I was very allergic to that. And my work started to shift thinking about how to slow down the ways we draw conclusions. 
And um, I took a photography class while I was there. Again, not really photographing people, but objects, lighting, strange lighting conditions, and all these things that then shifted my work um, where I intentionally started making uh, uh, long exposure photographs to then render these sort of like blurry images. And so blur became a really expansive space for me to think about how to make the, to think about the figure, to think about um, something else. I think we're both interested in the sort of like liminal space, neither here, neither there, um, states of suspension. Um, and my personal interest in language and sort of the, the, the ways we use it, the sort of um, identifying the gray areas of language where it fails us sometimes, like as, as expansive as languages, we can always invent new words, we can shift the meaning of existing words, but there's often failure in how we have, in, in the ways we use it to either describe a condition or a situation or an experience, or to just, um, yeah, this tendency to want to, again, like draw a conclusion when I think that's not always, that doesn't always necessarily need to be the end goal of, of an experience. And, um, you know, looking at Felipe's work and this sort of way, what I said earlier, this way of sort of collapsing in, in a visual way of the figure ground, but thinking about how all those things embody um, ideas around um, belonging, around, um, uh, movement around liminality, thinking about thresholds. I mean, again, in this blue one, um, do you, is there a detail of it in here? Yeah, maybe two forward, but. Um, so again, I mean, with the, with the, you, these aren't stitched, right? The twine is sort of embedded twine, in the paper. It's embedded and glued, yeah, glued on the paper. Yeah. So it's also, there is very much a process of layering that happens yeah. and then a process of sanding and, and taking off. So in many ways, I, I cover the, the image to then reveal it, um, which I was interested in with this piece, you know, when, when you see it, you know, you're dealing with, a, with this monochrome painting and realizing that it, it eventually starts to reveal itself as you spend time with it, you know? And I think that's where, we're more invested. We're not really invested in a lazy viewer, <laughs> you know. I think I think it's such a gift, you know, to to sit with your work too, you know, and that it starts to reveal itself, you know, that you imagine that, you know, seeing your work on an image or even in a show, you pass it by, you think, oh, it's a charcoal drawing, whereas it's beyond a charcoal drawing, you know, it's layers and layers of either handwriting or, or this manually or stamping to create this this image, you know. Is there a, a detail or not a detail, a process shot of this one in here, right? No, I think there's or, process shots of, of other ones. Okay. Well, I, I um, so we see like red and black and uh, other sort of like colors and layers emerging um, in this field of blue and so I, you know, what you described this sort of like layering process, but uh, I, I guess maybe this might segue to an end, uh, a sort of mutual interest in um, archaeology, this sort of accumulation of material and then an excavation that kind of happens in the way you add and subtract on your surfaces. Yeah. Um, that I think draws lines between other work that I don't think is in the slideshow, but that are sort of like clear references to um, kind of ethnog ethnographic interests, um, archeology, span Mesoamerica, uh, Mesoamerica um, that sort of thing. Not to change the subject, but. No, I mean, I think it's a, it's a good, good point. And I think I'm glad that I have this image here um, because in many ways, you know, I also want to talk about the archive, you know, in many ways, the two projects prior to the projects that I showed prior to this were actually in reaction to it, like actual images, right? So I was dealing with actual images and maybe transferring them in different ways, whether it was it embroidering or, or printing the actual image. 
where I wanted to in many ways shift from that, but still I'm working from the archive and working from things that that interest me, which one of, one of those things that they mentioned is archaeology. And, and this piece in many ways came from that. And this piece is responding to uh, a cave painting uh, between uh, the, between, uh, I think it's Guatemala and Mexico um, and this cave of, of two men embracing each other. You know, so it's like, what is the earliest queer history, whether that was a queer, uh, a depiction or not, you know, so it's like how to transfer that and, and, and to my own sort of way of making so and then I made this if these two men kind of mimic in the same pose uh, that that drawing was mimicking of these two embracing each other, you know, because I think I was speaking to this the idea of, of queerness that in, in art, you know, that sometimes and it's and that I do enjoy too, that when we see queerness is sometimes in an overly sexual way that we rarely see images of queerness in such a tender, tender way or tender moments of queerness. Um, so I did a series of these, I did three of them in the same manner um, where one is not able to fully know what is happening and you kind of see these layers of either just affairs, just kind of bodies overlapping, but then the image, you know, sort of starts to reveal itself. Um, slowly. And that's sort of my interest in archaeology, not in an academic way at all, you know, but I think I'm interested in how also archaeology is such a problematic uh, uh, field, you know, and the way um, problematic, but also interesting field that we're adding meaning to, to, to things, you know, um, but also extracting things from, from their actual places, which is, you know, what I've, my research and, and mostly what is known as Mexico now and how that has worked through a process of, of identity creation that has much been that the project in Mexico dealing with with these artifacts um, and, and thinking that these are these are people that are no longer here, which in most cases are still here, you know, like these. Um, so that's that's very much obviously I'm glad you brought that up in this piece, you know, and and that is very much where all the work is very much driven from not from uh, not working directly from a specific source, but from a fragmentation of sources, you know, and it's how, how do I make or render an image with fragmented uh, parts, you know, and that's what yeah. I was, I guess, yeah, I was interested in, in how, you know, I, I, I mentioned this earlier, but I think in both of our, our work, uh, fragmentation, and I, I would say collage and layering is, is important to our practices as uh, as a form that breaks to unity, right? So I think that's what I, 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 I very much see in your work too, and 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 in my work too, of this sort of like pulling from different sources uh, to make to make something to make a, a different uh, a different space. Well, so let's maybe fold in um, a conversation around mythology because um, I know that's there, and and maybe. Um, uh, more apparent in some of the other images um, that we have here. Um, do you want to go to? Sorry, I've, I've got my cheat sheet. <laughs> the uh, second to last slide. 19, I think, page 19. Yeah. I'll go back. These here. Yeah. So I guess maybe, Katrina, would be good for me to, to sort of speak about what I spoke about, the sort of fugitive body. Yeah. Know, that, that I'm still very much in, interested in. And, and I, you can see here, you know, through a convergence of interest and in science fiction, but also obviously in migration and queerness, and as we mentioned, anthropology. But what you can see here, but through a syncretic use of both uh, collage and printmaking, my work explores these ideas about the fugitive body, and and a fugitive body that is always on the run, but is um, but lives in concealment, but also lives without status, or as Fred Moten would would say, is uh, uh, to live without credit. You know, and I reconstruct new imaginaries of neither here nor there, you know, allowing the fugitive body to 
to make use of imagination as a tool for liberation, but also to transcend circumstances. And my work is very much concerned with the body as, as praxis and, and the possibilities for making subjects contain their own uh, complexities and, and, and agency, which I very much see in your work too, you know? And, and, and by that, I, I aim to create new, new meaning by working together with different creative languages and doing so, telling sort of an alternative story and history and alternative modes of, of inhabiting uh, a time and space. Um, and, and I would say that, um, that my most recent practice investigates how memory and migration and displacement, as, you, as we mentioned, and in the bio, it, it produces a state of hybridity. And that's how I see, and it's very much related to my experience, right? That my experience here as, a, as, a, as an immigrant person and, and who I have lived as undocumented for a large part of my life. And, and to this date, I'm in this current situation of limbo. My, my sort of uh, interest in citizenship has changed over time. And also my interest in belonging has changed over time. Right, that I think in regards to citizenship, I mean, what is it to desire something that doesn't desire you? <laughs> and, and thinking of questioning that, you know, and, 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 and very much, I think that's what very much I'm interested in, in, in the themes in the work right now that I'm making of these sort of, um, these sort of figures made from different parts, you know, because the work in a way recycles itself, you know, some like using fragments from other pieces that, that, that I was cutting so the, the, the work is always giving new life to other, to other bodies. Um, yeah, I was gonna and, ask uh, about repetition and how that sort of propels you forward in your work. Yeah, the, I guess the repetition, you know, here for me might be like the use of materials from previous projects, um, but also the repetition of, of cutting this, you know, like cutting a single part or, or embroidering, um, which repetition in many ways um, is very much of the, the the content and the work and this idea how to how to layer something up to uncover or cover something um, that works for for the actual um, themes in the work. Right, I mean something I was thinking about um, uh, when it, just a moment ago. Um, thinking about how you uh, are, especially with the first images that you showed, the one that's included in the show at Occidental, showing these sort of um, precarious states and how the um, in your work, you're adding this kind of interference that I think you refer to as like deferring the gaze. Um, that That's so interesting as, as like a way, um, you know, getting past just acknowledging or even representing or showing a certain condition, but uh, um, sort of moving the, making material decisions so that it kind of embodies a certain condition and even moving towards like works like what we see on the screen now of, of imagining another kind of condition that sort of maybe perhaps doesn't free one from a, precarious state, but does offer um, another way of seeing and imagining um, a world that could be made or perhaps is here, but maybe just outside of our grasp or perception or something like that. Um, I, looking at your work and even, you know, things I'm working through is like always in the space of like, things at the edge of our perception. Mm -hmm. And so the what you're doing in your work does that with mine, you know, from a distance, it's very difficult to maybe parse out that um, I'm making these sort of like intricate text drawings, writing, either handwriting, uh, text and repetition or stamping, or even more recently, scoring or debossing text into a paper. Um, and so it is an experience, you have an, a certain experience from a distance, and then there's a sort of like journey or, you know, you get closer to the work. And I think this is the case for both of us. And there's a sort of like slow read. If you sit with it, it begins to reveal itself to you. Yeah. You start to notice things that 
are never available to you in photographs. <laughs> like we're, we're all looking at photographs right now, but there's so many, I mean, you can say this about most work, but there's so many nuances that you, that's not available to us in, in viewing it this way. I mean, in mine, um, I don't know if you wanna go back to maybe the detail um, of the drawing that's up in the, in the, in the presentation. Uh, but um, there's also a process that of embossing. So like carving these large woodblock um, uh, shapes, running those through the press, doing a blind embossment, which means um, an embossment without ink. And so it's most visible before I start to uh, draw um, on top of it or render the image with text. Um, but there are these sort of like subtle shadows in play. And I know shadows is like deeply, um, uh, seems to be deeply wrapped up in, in the work you make. Um, mm -hmm. You've heard me sort of share <laughs> my obsession with shadows, which also happened while I was, um, came out of my experience in grad school. But uh, I read this book um, called The Shadow Club and the author, um, starts off the book describing his first time really looking at a lunar eclipse. And he says, you know, with the aid of the telescope for the first time, he didn't see the moon as a sort of like lofty glowing orb in the sky. He saw it as this like massive rock. And so mm -hmm. there's this line, this poetic line that says the shadow of the moon, uh, the shadow of the earth reveals the true nature of the moon. And so thinking about shadows as another kind of space that ordinarily or conventionally we think of as in, uh, inferior to seeing to things in, in the bright of day or in the brightest of light. But now shifts the shadow to suggest that it is also a condition that can reveal. And I think there's some something in the way you work that brings that out as well. Yeah, I mean, I could say that's a good point. I could say maybe it also speaks to um to darkness, right? That I yeah. think that's something you're also interested in and I'm also interested in, you know, because I was speaking to the process that I work sometimes dictates to my color palette. And I'm very much interested in that color palette of um, that develops after the back and forth printing and thinking about darkness as, as, um, as sort of shifting the legibility of the gaze, right? But also as a, uh, that it, it, it allows for, for freedom and transformation. You know, that, that, that for me, it's be such a, so, so such a queer time and space. Mm -hmm. So thinking, I've been thinking obviously like if you look a lot of my body of work, it's very much situated in sort of dark palette and thinking about that, that thinking about that transformation, but also thinking also my experience of migration, you know, that I came to this conclusion, why am, am I so attracted to this sort of specific, um, darkness um, that I that I'm speaking of and sort of like purplish sort of like dusk you know in many ways and it's and it's because when I left Mexico uh, when I was seven that was a time to that's that's how I remember leaving Mexico at dusk you know that also like migration happens at nine or at dusk you know so that sort of transformation happens and how important it is and has been to the world and I feel also in your work too. Yeah, can we go back to the map image? Because I think there's also this sort of, um, it's, it's not glitter, but there's some sort of like dust um, reflective, uh, what is it called? Mica or something. Like powder probably, yeah. Yeah, that's in there, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think that's what I liked about the process so that obviously I mentioned that I'm not fully in control. You know that I that I lay obviously what I'm able to do is lay pigments where I want them to be, but the water there's so much water that obviously once I lay the paper over everything starts to move and shift, but also since there's textures already on the paper that it's only able to transfer a few things, um, mm -hmm. so it becomes a sort of concealment that happens with with specific layers, but also with with sort of this metallic that happens it sort of also it acts as a conceal to re sort of re reflect something. Um, that happens in the work too. Yeah, I mean, I think because I, the work sort of brings up um, these kind of 
binaries, but not, they don't exist in the binary. Again, it's a sort of like liminal space between. So like um, night and day, you're talking about the sort of like dusk, um, mm. which is in between day daytime and nighttime, the sort of, uh, and the sort of like color palette of the map it's almost like this emerging light out of darkness, like this sort of barely visible colors yeah. um, in the under layers from, you know, what's still available to us of the original map. Um, there's also, uh, uh, what else, like bound, you know, thinking about boundaries and a kind of expanse. And I think we're both kind of identifying these op binary oppositions and pointing towards the sort of in in between this interstitial space that seems to be gener uh, generative for both of us. Yeah, I could say that. I, mean, yeah, I see that, and I think that has a lot to do with you know speaking to someone in relation to the immigrant imaginary, right? that how performative, you know, seeing this as a child, you know, how performative migrant bodies are. And by that, I mean that depending on our surroundings and depending we are, we're either masking or we're either revering, uh, um, revealing ourselves or not, you know? So there's always some like awareness to location. And, and, and I think that comes back to this in between is that we're always like shifting, this sort of shape, shape shifting depending on our location. Um, and, and thinking much about that and also in the work, you know, that that this sort of happens, this sort of masking too that happens too, you know, that um, when we're thinking about a mask, you know, obviously it's also consuming, but also, but also makes you stand out, you know? Um, so it's like realizing when to wear the mask, when not to wear the mask, when is it dangerous to wear a mask? And is this constant, I mean, I'm glad you brought that in between us because I feel like that's, that's where I'm most, most comfortable in. And, and this in between this, because that's what I've been living, you know, this past, I mean, more than since I was seven in this country, I mean, I could say. Um, so I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, uh, I, I know we've got um, a few images we haven't looked at yet. I'd love to talk about um, Belkis <laughs> I, 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 I included Belkis because it just seemed like such a good, good break. Um, because, you know, I was thinking not of the limitations we have in our practices, you know, because I feel like we've reduced our tools and our ways of making and how with such limiting tools, we have expanded our ways of making, you know, and I'm thinking yeah. of you, you know, just how important obviously paper is and the specific paper you use, you know, and then obviously there's this embossing that happens and then the writing or stamping. Uh, and then through that, you're obviously creating, basically rendering these figures through tone, right? And 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 myself too, sort of not depending on the press and kind of pushing away from that and, and just sticking to sort of not depending on materials, because I think what's important is not to make the same mistakes, you know, you want to make mm. new mistakes. Uh, and I think that's that was a, such a shift in, in the practice and, and breakthrough because of the map. And and I included Belkis because obviously we've talked about Belkis and, and obviously I've, I've shared my obsession with her and then just how much of a master she was and what she did and 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 how you know like i mean she's no longer living and she died at such a young age you know in her early 30s but produced an, an immense body of work you know that i had i had only seen in images and through digital and digital ways and, and it wasn't maybe until recently i had seen her work in person and obviously it's a whole different situation and how transformative that was but I included that because I was thinking about like just how she pushed that medium. And here, obviously, she's working through Colograph yeah. and basically just using black ink to create these various tones, but also working with mythology and, and the myth mythology of, uh, of, of this specific uh, um, religion. Um, and just obviously thinking that we're, we're working in, in very similar ways now. Right, right. I mean, you know, I, I'm thinking of like, this idea that um, uh, limitations uh, sort of allow for uh, a kind of depth. Like I, I think of it like there's a dot and from a distance, it's just a dot. The closer you get, the more you zoom in, it becomes an expansive landscape. 
And so I, you know, loving working, identifying limitations or maybe not limitations, but maybe identifying or setting up a set of parameters. In my case, text and uh, what can I do with text? What is the, and then that, you know, causes me to think about the materiality of writing on a page, the mm -hmm. history of writing. And it's just, it's so re rich and so deep. And even, you know, the most recent kind of experimentation that's come out of this very focused way of working is starting to think about weaving and uh, the relationship between text and textile um, etymologically, but then also like, how can I literally do that? And making these text drawings on paper and processing them into threads and then weaving with them to make a textile to bridge the two, all that comes out of a very sort of focused way of, of um, working with uh, an established set of parameters that um, help me really push the boundaries. And I think that and maybe it's like not even just pushing the boundaries, but, but blurring them. Like, are we making drawings, paintings, prints? And they're kind of like uh, D, all of the above kind of thing. Exactly. I mean, you bring a good point, but I also was thinking right now of also, you know, I spoke about how the work itself is very much embedded with various things, but but thinking about a, about a project you did where you correct me if I'm wrong, you burnt either a drawing and, and made that made that sort of the the residue of the residue of that drawing into actual ink to make a new drawing. Uh, so thinking just how you're embedding all these things, but also with the weaving too, you know, just how not just the weaving you're doing, but weaving was also, you know, I could say for parts of Mexico was also a part to, to inject ideas and information um, and how obviously that's um, um, ways of sort of, um, ways of, of many ways resist, resistance, no? Mm -hmm. of, of, of weaving the sort of uh, uh, these informations that you're only, only so many people are able to, to, to know about. Um, but I also, I think what I would want to um, also not miss in this conversation is how you situate you, your artistic practice with, with writers, right? And that's also a, a very a part that I share too. And I'm glad you spoke about language. And, and I think for me, language is, is so complicated in so many ways. Um, and what is it not to express yourself fully because you don't have the language, you know? And I'm thinking about Spanish, you know, which obviously now Spanish was my first language, but now it seems so foreign to me. Um, and I'm only capable to, to express myself uh, to, uh, I guess, in, to a limit. Um, and now obviously English, um, but obviously you situate yours and going back to the writers that I guess that I'm thinking about that you are very much interested in and you have rest, reference in work and I guess I'm uh, Audrey Lord, you know, Toni Morrison and how that much of that writing is embedded in, 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 in some of the drawings you've done, you know, and for yeah. me, you know, but also I guess the way you also you title your pieces, which I guess I could also say in comparison to me how poetic some of the titles I used to are, are poetic and are drawn from from sources that I'm reading, you know, and 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 in my practice, you know, I I, I would want to say that I want to situate a more artistic practice uh, with, with writers and thinkers of, in relation to queer theory. You know, I've been thinking about Jose Esteban Munoz and recently about Gayashri Gopinath, who, who in many ways have, have allowed me to reclaim uh, a queer futurity that values difference over sameness, you know, and resisting assimilation and embracing difference and incompleteness. Because there's something that I see in your work in my in my work too that that incompleteness functions as as a not as a, not, not as a negative trope. You know, I think there's something there that 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 I see in both of our work in relation to incompleteness. But also, you know, you spoke about this earlier and 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 thinking about practices of mythology and storytelling and narrative making. You know, as modes of as modes and tools um, for survival. Uh, that had been crucial to, I feel, to both of our practices. You know, I, I draw from artists, you know, like Ana Mendieta, Laura Aguilar, you know, and writers like Erwich Danticat, and, and their journey 
and their story and themes in their work resonate, you know, with me deeply. And that's sort of that, that artistic lineage that shapes my, my work. And it's an exploration uh, of the effects of displacement, which I, you know, it later, it later kind of came to me like, wait, why do I like Ana Mendieta so much? You know, why am I obsessed with her? And why do I like Alaura Aguila? And, and and which Dante who's a writer, it's because they all had very similar experiences of migration and displacement. Um, but I think it's it's also um, it's also ways the human body um, is remade in order to survive, you know, and the possibilities for for um, for queer futures um, are very much anchored in in recovered past. Yeah, I mean, I think from what you just said, I, I'm thinking about like figures that are not static because in our sort of day-to-day um, -day experience, like what what is static? So mm -hmm. with you, the way, again, the way you've um, merged the figure with, with the ground and the sort of fluidity of the figures, especially when there's more than one the, the embrace of the uh, of the blue one, for instance, and myself was through um, a blurred image, which is a figure in motion. Mm -hmm. And thinking of that space as gener generative, because I think uh, there's a there's a desire. Um, I'm I'm speaking broadly, but there's a desire to have a easily consumable image like the static one, it's like you look at it for a second and you got it, or you think you have it. But even the most um, explicit images, perhaps you don't, you can't have, you don't get all the information. You get the superficial information. Even, you know, the, a photograph has materiality to it. It's got a sheen, it's got a backside. Even, um, you know, that's a beautiful thing I loved about um, looking at your work, like the backside of the map, that that also uh, embodies, it, it makes the, the work into like an object that embodies a certain condition rather than, ju rather than just illustrates something. And I think even if we can't articulate it in a really conscious way, um, we receive these, uh, we're receiving something as a viewer looking at it. Um, even for a, a viewer who maybe doesn't linger for a long time, you look at a map, you know it's a map, but it's a map that's been obscured in a certain way. So you know something about obscuring a map with boundaries has some meaning and conveys something even if they don't sit long enough to see the figures emerge out of it. And I think, um, you know, while we want the sort of like long patient viewer, I think this being able to reach and I and I'm still working on it. You know, I think we're we're all artists are, are on a journey, but to make an an object a thing that embodies these conditions that um, are meaningful to us, I mean that's where we want to be because it does things beyond what we can articulate what it's doing. We've been talking, do you, do you have any last things to say before we answer some questions? No, I guess we could go into questions. Um, okay, I think I'm supposed to do something here. Um, I could just, uh, look at, I've got um, a question from, oh, I don't know if I'm supposed to say who it's from. Anyway, Amy Lightford, because she teaches at Occidental. <laughs> Have you ever made work in collaboration with one another? Would you ever consider that? And if so, what would that look like? P.S. Thank you so much for this presentation and conversation. Thanks for the question. Um, we have not. We have not. <laughs> have not but I think we've, we've, it seems like, you know, hard to answer because we've shared so much time together, you know? Yeah. And have been in conversation. Obviously we did grad school together and-, um, and But we also did Next Haven, another year Haven, together. You know, um, um, there for a year. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I would love to, maybe this is, maybe this is the, the right time for an invitation <laughs> to, to work together. Yeah, yeah. 
I love the idea. Um, I, I, I'd have a hard time saying what that might look like. Exactly. But probably, it would probably start with a printmaking process, maybe. <laughs> that seems right. Um, yeah. Uh, another question I see. Did you always know what you wanted to share? Uh, did you always know that you wanted to share this story through this specific medium? Did you ever try other forms of expression or art? I'll let you answer that. Um, you know, I think I've never really spoken about this, but I, my first sort of introduction to art making was photography. And I think it makes sense, you know, obviously that I work with collage and the printed material. Um, and, but I did mention, obviously, I did, you know, experience printmaking before undergrad and, and printmaking for me spoke differently than, than what I was taking there. You know, I did obviously take painting, you know, and, and drawing other, and sculpture, um, but nothing, nothing spoke to me as much as printmaking did in the way that I think, you know, it's such an abstract form of making that, that it's very that it's very much still embedded in the work I do. I mean, the, the work I do is layered, just like printmaking. You know, so there's such a, a, a abstract a way of making, um, and it just seems sort of the, for me the the way to sort of peel off basically those themes in the work that I was working on. So it was good to show I me. Mean, so for me, it was good to obviously. I mean, I think I mentioned that I really haven't shown that image, you know, that right now it's at Oxy since it was made. You know, you know, I. I went to school, you know, at the time too with Tomashi Jackson and Tomashi had um, had curated a show while we were in school and I had shown that piece, you know, uh, in a different format that had embroidered, had just embroidered one word on it. Um, so to see it again, you know, in a different light and, and, and I think good to just kind of compare it to what I'm making now, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go to, oh, a question from Rafa. Uh, I find your rejection of citizen, citizenship and legibility incredibly powerful and how that rejection is embodied in your work. I also appreciate your candor when you speak of why want something that doesn't want you. Does some of this thinking carry over to the idea of art, its frameworks, i.e. art history, the canon? How do you relate to these art structures that have uh, to much degree neglected and marginalized creative communities in the same ways that institutionalized racism and xenophobia functions in the U.S. Oh, Rafa. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's such a, you know, um, well, I mean, it, this just goes, you, you kind of brought up something earlier and maybe I could expand is just how, how I'm so happy that I came across you when I did. And by that, I mean that I, we encountered each other in, in grad school and how obviously we all have our own different experiences of being in that program, but just seeing how conversations of specific people were treated, you know, and I think people of color were, were critiqued in a very specific, a very specific way. And, and, and also this sort of demand to to sort of like absorb everything as fast as possible. That for me, you know, I was like, that's why I was interested in like not, you know, I feel like it felt like I was always teaching, you know, or there was an expectation of like, oh, like we know what Felipe is gonna make. And, uh, and I think that's sort of me navigating the art world, right? That I, yes, you know, migration is part of my experience and that's embedded in the work, but that's not what, you know, being, being undocumented is not an identity. <laughs> You know, um, that I struggle with that in, the, in regards to the art world that for the longest, when my work was being talked about or myself, you know, I was always being described as the undocumented artist Felipe Baeza and not Felipe Baeza who happens to be undocumented. Uh, so, um, and I think it just showed me, you know, like, all right, I, I mean, there's so much I, out of my control but when there is, you know, I try to to be fully present. Um, but also, I mean, in regards to to sort of um, to art, art institutions, you know, and and thinking how right now during these times is deciding when when these institutions are being genuine and when they are uh, being performative. 
Um, so I think it's also being cautious of, 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 of the actions they do, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot, I mean, I, there's a lot in that sort of, in Rafa's question and comment in that needs to get dissected deeply. It's like, who's running these institutions? I mean, and by that, I mean the trustees and how are they making money? Uh, and, but also how are things collected, you know? Um, I mean, I mean, right now there's such a um, um, interest in, in Latinx art, you know, and, and me still figuring out what that means, you know, what is, what is Latinx? Uh, right. but, in, but in regards to, uh, to the art world, but also to the art market, you know, I feel like it could just be a placeholder for the art market. Right. I mean, it's interesting thinking about like, you know, you're problematizing a lot of things um, in your own work, especially like thinking about the, the photograph, the source material for the image and the oxy show, you know, who takes the photos, how does it get disseminated, that sort of thing. And then you're, you're um, transforming them in a way to um, offer us an, another way, uh, offer us more information um, uh, and, and a condition to, to think about it differently, but then it then cycles out, it meets the world in a way, and it happens to have to meet the world oftentimes in a, in a sort of commercial way. And, and um, as artists who uh, works with galleries, works with institutions, and it's, but it's, it's interesting, I think working in the way of, um, thinking about the illegible, um, uh, blurring the image, almost in a way it kind of resists the after, what comes after in terms of how it then meets the world and who ends up with it, how, you know, how it lives on. Um, I think yeah. the interference that's in the work lives on as it moves through the world, which True. seems so, some, like a, a, some resistance in a way. True. I mean, I guess I could just add really quick is that going back to the sort of in-between is now that I've always struggled with these questions of identity, you know, because it's been my question too, <laughs> you know, of belonging. Um, but, and it's changed over time, you know, as you grow up, I, you know, obviously I started to accept parts of myself that I didn't accept, you know, in regards to my queerness. But in regards to belonging, you know, I'm not really considered an American artist here, you know, I'm considered a Mexican artist. But in, to Mex in Mexico, to Mexican artists, I'm not a Mexican artist, you know, so there's this constant like, you know, back and forth, which I'm happy to navigate, you know, I think that's, and I think that's also where I want to complicate things, you know. Um, the other thing is like, I rarely say I'm Mexican, you know, because I, what does, you know, I think that's a social complicated thing for me. And it's not to say like, oh, I'm American, that, that is not the way at all that I want to, to put it. But I think, um, it's sort of like me trying to figure out, and I think that's also what I'm doing through the work, managing these questions through the work, you know, and 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 I think, you know, seeing how other artists, you know, I mentioned, you know, Ana Mendieta, who also left Cuba at, a, at, at an early age, and, and, and seeing how also, that's how she dealt with sort of like ideas of belonging, and and thinking obviously at Edward Stantikat, who also, you know, left Haiti at, at a young age, and very much in a similar way like I did, uh, also reacting to a new setting, you know, it's sort of like you've been shifted to, to a new planet, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and my experience was of like going to Chicago, which is a, is a, it's a, has a large Mexican population. So it's like going from a, a brown city to another brown city, you know, <laughs> where right. they spoke English, you know? Um, so thinking about those, those parallels of, of like, you know, trying to like, in many ways, um, I wouldn't say fit in, you know, but I, I think at that time I was like trying to fit in. And I mean, I think. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, not to go on, I'm going to get to another question, but um, it, it's complicating all these categories. I mean, part, a lot of what language does for us is help us to categorize and make distinctions between one thing and another. And it serves, serves us to a certain extent, but at a certain point it, it fails us. And even talking about, um, you know, identity, uh, nationality, all these things around belonging, who's the we, who's them, who's us, that sort of thing. These aren't fixed, but they, they 
they're not inherently fixed, but they get fixed in terms of these systems that we create to uphold them and to sustain these kinds of hierarchies. And with the with your work, you're um, acknowledging these boundaries and, and categories, but in a way kind of dissolving them with what you've done to them, um, merging them together and, and uh, blurring them in a way too. Um, so, okay, another question uh, from Sienna, one of my students. How do you balance making immigrant stories, queer stories, and other uh, marginalized communities stories visible slash publicly recognized while honoring the importance of remaining invisible? Hmm. Well, I mean, I think maybe I don't know if I how to answer that, but I think that's, you know, in the beginning, your undergrad, it was sort of complicated to work with, with, with those images, right? You know, because we were talking about 2005 and I was living for the first time outside of Chicago um, for many reasons. Why? Because I, that was sort of my only mode of, of higher education. Uh, but at the same time, I, was, I wasn't fully um, open about my immigration status. You know, but I think in that regard, I think to respond to the question, you know, it's like how to work with these images. And I said it before, how to work with the archive without replicating the same systems of violence that made those images, right? Right. Because I don't know who made those images. I don't know who shot those images, you know, um, and, and, and in what format they were shown. Uh, and, um, and I think it was also not to romanticize such experience too. I think that's also one thing that I've been dealing with and with working with, with, working with those images and also why I stopped is I didn't want to romanticize such images, especially in, in the way that they were being shown now, you know, because obviously they were being shown and, and to have to contextualize the work. And that's why I agreed to have this specific work in this show, because it just made sense, you know. It just doesn't make sense to have such works. And that's why I feel like the complication gets uh, murky for me to have such images in, in like this in a gallery setting, you know, where there's like really no like no context beyond, you know, that it's a gallery. Um, and there are other issues, obviously, working with it. Um, but I mean, in regards, I don't know if I understand the question, but in regards, I've been, I've been, you know, I think that's also the thing about being visible and and, and not being visible is that for me for a while, I've been really open about my situation. And in regards to be like, you know, being open with friends, you know, I think that's also for me has been, you know, as many people will not see it, but for me it has been helpful. Uh, to be visible just for the safety of my my own livelihood. Right. Um, thank you. And there's two similar questions. So I'm just gonna collapse them. It, both are asking about what we're reading. You mentioned uh, Edward Danticat and uh, so they wanna know other people you're reading. So in general, what are, what are, what are you reading right now? Oh, right now, well, I'm revisiting, uh, revisiting Cruising Utopia by Jose Esteban Munoz, uh, who I did mention, uh, and someone, I don't have the book on me right now, um, it's Gayatri Gopinath, Un Unruly Visions, um, which is what, what I'm thinking about right now, and, these, and she talks about uh, modes of suspension. You know, and, and, and speaking in regards to queerness and, and being undocumented as, as modes of suspension. But in that suspension, there's so much richness. Um, so that's, that's what I'm reading. But, but, yeah. but that, that which, you know, that which I'm, Edward Danticat is always obviously on my mind, you know? Um, yeah. I think I would, I'm, I mean, for those who have never read her work, I, I would highly advise to either read, uh, Crick, start with Crick Crack, um, or um, the farming of bones. Yeah, uh, I'm uh, always rereading Toni Morrison, um, and lately I've been like really into her essays. Uh, one in particular called "Sites of Memory," where she's talking about the activity of writing, which has been really beautiful to me. Um, right now, I'm uh, at a a short residency. So the stack of books I brought with me are um, uh, Mario Gooden, an uh, architect, his book called Dark Space, 
uh, uh, Ya Jassi, Transcendent Kingdom, I'm hopefully about to read. Uh, I brought an Angela Davis reader and um, a book uh, called Flash of the Spirit, African and Afro-American Art and Philosophy. Um, and then I'm also rereading uh, this philosophical text about the theory of, of affordances. So I'm all over the place. <laughs> Um, so we're kind of coming to the end here. Maybe we can do one more, let's see. Would you rather talk about grad school or <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, working with and working with stories that are so heavily stigmatized yet personal? Would you rather talk about grad school or pain? <laughs> I, mean, Maybe I, think that's cool. I think they're both painful, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think what I would say about grad school, you know, grad school for me, I think in both of our cases, you know, we took a, a very much a gap between undergrad and grad school. And I think all I could say is that, that I'm glad I did it at the right time. You know, I'm glad I didn't do it right after undergrad and I never had a desire to go to grad school, you know? But I think for me, you know, I was, I was living in a situation where for a while, because of my situation, I wasn't doing nothing artistically. I was frustrated that I wasn't that I didn't have sort of a creative output. Yes, I was you know trying to make work on the side and, and through my bedroom. You know that was my studio, um, and I felt you know this is in 2016 that I felt you know it was a time to just apply. Um, and I, I think I want to say that I treated it as a residency. You know, <laughs> it was a two year residency that was extremely extremely transformative. Um, for many reasons, you know, I think, you know, we went through the program to the same program and just having, you know, having that space that I've never had before, the physical space to have a studio, a studio practice, to even, you know, know what that means, um, but also to have conversations on the daily, you know, which sometimes, you know, felt tiring, but I think for me, that's what I benefit more from that program, like the one-on-one -on -one conversations, um, but also I think something that we both took advantage was, you know, that the whole school was open to us, that we were able to take classes outside of the department, which for me saved me, you know, to take courses outside of, out of, out of, uh, out of uh, uh, the art school was extremely um, life-saving for me and in many ways um, um, helped me survive that place. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Same, and I, uh, same, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say it, it's pretty much the same long time, like you said, long time between undergrad and grad school. I did want to go to grad school. I actually really liked school, but just life, um, I was kind of dragging my feet applying. Finally, I did and uh, got in and it was really two years you know, I think both of us, we we had shown our work. Um, I, at the time, had a gallery for a while, uh, but grad school really kind of bought me time to just work and like, that's all I had to focus on. And the advantage of like all the resources of the school, I took classes, I took philosophy classes, anthropology, um, a music class, uh, what else? Like half the classes I took were actually outside of the School of Art. But having the space, having the conversation, even the tough conversations, it was like, you know, and I think taking the amount of time I did before going, um, maybe I can call it a, a, lo a level of maturity, or maybe it's just like a, a level of like, being able to just identify like what's worth keeping and holding on to and what's worth discarding like take all the information take it in you're not you don't have to agree with everything but listen even to the opinions you don't really that you don't feel are relevant but it, you get some perspective of like how how viewers again like draw conclusions about what you're doing and that's all useful to some extent and you just, it was a matter of figuring out what was going to remain useful to me that then keep me going. But it was like a great time of experimentation and trying all sorts of things that I otherwise probably would not have. And I'm the better artist for it, if I must say. 
Um, so I know we're, we're at the end and, um, you know, I, I want to say thank you to Occidental who, again, you know, my alma mater, alma mater, I now teach there and it's a joy, but I'm so happy to be in conversation with another artist, peer, a friend, um, and I'm so thankful that you participated in the In Plain Sight um, and that uh, your work in one way or another can be seen here. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't know, do you, if you have anything else you want no, to No, I'm just extremely yeah. happy and thankful to be obviously in conversation with you um, to see your face, but also to in many ways uh, speak, it up, speak about just our work and comparison. Um, that I think there, there are a lot of things that we missed today and to continue the conversation, you know, um, eventually, hopefully in person. Um, and likewise, thank you. Uh, thanks to uh, obviously everyone that made this happen and, and a huge thank you to Frankie Fleming who, who helped off with the tech and the slideshow. <laughs> thank you. And also thank you to the audience a lot for, I mean, we've almost gone over close to two hours now <laughs> uh, who have stayed with us. Uh, and, you know, there obviously there's a, there's a lot to talk, uh, but I'm, I'm extremely grateful of the conversation we had today.